Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Prime Comments. We have a jam-packed episode, 21 videos, meaning we have at least 21 different comments to sift through. Extra long because we did not have a Prime Comments episode last week, and I obviously am a day late, so I included videos up until the podcast episode that I released earlier today, which you can check up in the little I, I believe, up in this corner up here of the video. That being said, let's just hop right into it. Uh, so, I released a video a couple weeks ago that said Nintendo Switch has localized voice chat in Splatoon 2 land mode of Salmon Run. And Michael Coons, I'm sorry if I mispronounced any names this time, had this to say. Very interesting. So this means the Switch has the possibility to use the mic from a headset. With this in mind, this is not a problem of hardware anymore. It's only a question of programming. And knowing it's just a problem of programming, we should start to ask Nintendo why they take the relatively much time, this is his words, uh, for an app around voice chat compared to just creating the voice chat, which they already created as we have heard in this video, which means they would only have to improve the programming behind the current voice chat and add more functionality to make it work. They could maybe, this is actually a little question about how many resources they have left over, even make native voice chat on the main OS to allow friends to open up a chat room and talk to each other, while even playing different games or none at all. Integrating the possibility of Bluetooth headsets would also be pretty simple. Just make one headset take over one controller slot to stay inside the boundaries of Bluetooth, and everything is fine. They could have used a second controller slot for another headset and maybe even make it possible to have player one and player two audio separated. The integration into the voice chat would of course be no problem. I love my Nintendo Switch, so having all these additional functions would just give this little extra to my already pretty good experience. And I genuinely agree with what you're saying. I think voice chat should be native on the Switch. I've always thought voice chat should be native to the Nintendo Switch. The fact you have to use a phone app, a phone app that actually isn't that good for voice chat. The actual functionality of voice chat in the app is bad, and I realize it's going to get better over time. It has to get better over time, right? Why would they? I mean, Nintendo's going to be charging money, and part of it is for access to this app, and if a functionality of the app isn't very good, it's not going to feel like it's worth the money, even though it's only 20 bucks a year. I understand that's cheap. But yeah, it's... It's definitely interesting. I think voice chat over the phone should be an option. I've always thought it should be an option. And then the fact that the Switch has literal proof it can do native voice chat. There's no hardware restrictions for it. Nintendo just has to make the decision they want to do it. And I don't even think it's us pushing them to do it that's going to make it happen. I think it's going to take a game like Call of Duty or some other massive multiplayer game coming to the Switch. Maybe it's Rocket League. Uh, to convince Nintendo, have those developers talk to them and be like, look, we really need this to be native on the console for the best possible experience for our users. And I think Nintendo would eventually give in. So, yeah, I, I mostly agree with what you have to say. Um, yeah, thanks for your comment this week. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I also released a video that said, uh, is Microsoft and Xbox the new Sega? This was the second episode of Outside the Box. And the mind of Thomas had this to say, I think they will be the next Sega. The Xbox One has been lagging behind the PlayStation 4 in sales for quite some time now, and now both the Switch and the PlayStation 4 are outselling it. Plus, the Xbox One X is going to be way too expensive for average consumers, and hardcore gamers who care about graphics will just build a powerful PC instead. They're in a bad position at the moment, and if that keeps up, they will eventually give up and just go back to making PC games. And... That's the thing. If they just go back to just making PC games, that's not being Sega. Uh, Sega, when they bowed out of the console race, they bounced back by becoming a multi-platform developer. So if Microsoft backs out of the console race and all they do is make games on PC, that's... Uh, they, they, I mean, those PCs are running Windows. They already own the PC market. It, it's not really... It's just changing the focus away from home consoles to PCs rather than necessarily becoming a Sega. That, that's why I think anyone who thinks Microsoft's going to retreat to PC, that's retreating to PC. That's not that's not what happened to Sega. What happened to Sega is a very specific thing. They stopped making home consoles and became a multi-platform developer. Now, I don't think that's going to happen anyways. I think uh, 
Microsoft is going to resign themselves to a smaller community. I think, the, you know, you make a good point about the Xbox One X. It's only going to ring true with a certain consumer type. And yes, you know, they could go gaming PC side. Although right now you cannot build a gaming PC for as cheap as the Xbox One X that can perform as well as the Xbox One X. But that's neither here nor there. Prices will come down eventually. Uh, prices on GPUs especially will come down once crypto mining slows down. Crypto mining always seems to go through cycles on the internet, so I'm ho I'm assuming it'll slow down at some point next year. But at the same point, the Xbox One X is still going to have think people. You know, it's going to appeal to people. Uh, I have no interest myself in putting a PC underneath my TV, but I'm fine with putting an Xbox One X under there that can give me all the functionality I want out of my PC, anyways, while knowing that every single game released uh, for that platform is going to play on that platform without me having to fiddle with anything. Uh, and having a better, smoother OS that's more in tune with the rest of the smart devices in my house. So I think an Xbox One X makes sense uh, if Nintendo, or Nintendo, if Microsoft just wants to target an upper echelon of uh, gaming consumers. And I feel like that might be the future of what they'd plan to do. And if that's the case, then yes, they're always going to have a smaller install base, but that's not the point. The point is that that upper echelon of consumers has a product built specifically for them rather than products being built to try to reach as many consumers as possible which seems to be what sony does and seems to be what nintendo is doing currently moving on a couple weeks ago i also released a video uh, about meverse uh, meverse and other wii u features are being shut down in november and razorblade had this to say meverse was a nice idea but under nintendo's administration meverse was a mess Miiverse was full of irrelevant posts, false reporting, and tons of restrictions. I'm no Sony fanboy here, but Miiverse couldn't compete with how Sony handled online gaming communities. It's sad and it has to go, but I do hope Nintendo comes up with a better online social media feature for the Switch that isn't on the smartphone. And I find it interesting when anyone compares Miiverse to anything any other company has done. Sony didn't create um, a social media platform. They used Facebook and Twitter, which people already are on. Uh, same with with Xbox. Like Everyone just used the already existing social media networks. Nintendo was the only one to be like, look, we're going to create our own social media network. And I'm not saying it was perfect. It wasn't. Uh, you mentioned some of the restrictions I, that I didn't like. You mentioned uh, you know, how easy it is to get your account shut down. But it's, it's still something that I really enjoyed. I think Miiverse had its own charm. Uh, especially when it came to the amazing art people were able to create. And I hate that it's gone. And I don't think Nintendo's going to take another crack at it because as we've seen uh, with how their account systems work right now, you can already connect to Facebook and Twitter uh, and other social media networks. So that tells me that Nintendo's embracing all the other social media networks. They're not going to have their own anymore. Uh, and that's just the way it's going to be. Miiverse was great. It's gone. It sucks. And we're probably never going to see anything like it again. Anyways, moving on. Uh, our fourth video we're talking about here says, uh, Microsoft was open to all crossplay with Nintendo, and, and EA defends their decisions behind FIFA 18 on Switch. And Scully HQ had this to say, Do you think there will ever be a Call of Duty on Nintendo Switch? Short answer, yes. I think there will. Not this year, but I think next year or the year after there's a chance. And I say that because Call of Duty, it's not like... You know, Activision with Call of Duty has avoided Nintendo systems. I mean, the Wii had <laughs> had Call of Duty games. The Wii U had a Call of Duty game year one. So I think Activision is just taking a slower approach uh, this time around, and they're waiting to see if there's going to be a big enough install base that cares about Call of Duty kind of games. See, on Wii, they made multiple versions, and they all sold over a million copies. And I think that million copy threshold is where they are at to justify releasing it on Switch. So one, they want to see a bigger install base, and two, I think they want to see other third-party games that might cater to an audience like Call of Duty's uh, release on the platform and see how they do. So things like Skyrim, you know, if those games, L.A. Noir, if those games can perform well and they even move a million units at this early stage, I think that's when you're going to see Activision be like, look, we're bringing Call of Duty next year to Switch. Obviously, that won't be announced until like E3 next year, but yeah, Call of Duty's coming to Switch someday. As long as the Switch remains popular and keeps selling. Uh, moving on. Uh, 
this Switch passed a milestone in Japan. And Breath of the Wild was ranked number one in the top 100 games of all time. It's a video made about how uh, the Nintendo Switch passed 1.5 million units, severely faster than the PlayStation 4 did. And uh, Famitsu did a top 100 ranking thing, and Breath of the Wild was number one. Uh, and Victor Daniel Catlin had this to say, Congrats, Nintendo, but give us an amazing dungeon in the Champions Ballad. By the way, do you think there will be more DLC released after the Champions Ballad? And of course, the Champions Ballad is the final DLC pack coming to Breath of the Wild. Uh, I obviously want there to be a, an amazingly huge dungeon. I would like to see uh, them not... Because we know there's a new dungeon coming. I hope when they say that, they're not talking about a shrine. If it's just one new shrine, I think that's going to be very disappointing. Even if it's like 10, 20 new shrines, I still think that's going to be rather disappointing. When people hear dungeon, they're thinking of the Divine Beasts, and they're hoping that because the Divine Beasts were all tied into that original story, that this new secondary dungeon here, or whatever it is, is one of those massive labyrinths uh, that people, I think, were hoping would exist in Breath of the Wild. So I definitely hope that they at least explore that idea and see where it takes them, because I think the people on the team must have had a lot of ideas for dungeons like that that weren't necessarily built around the Divine Beast and the Ganon mechanic. Now, when I talk about DLC uh, and more being released, that really depends. It depends on how quickly Nintendo wants to turn around a new game. If they are going to have a quick follow-up to Breath of the Wild in 2019, I think we're done with DLC. If they are not going to have a, a, another you know, Zelda game even land on Switch, or if they think there's a chance another Zelda game can't land on Switch, or at least land exclusively on Switch, then I think Nintendo's going to be like, look, we'll, we'll go another year of DLC. Uh, right now, they haven't announced anything. There is a Nintendo Direct later this week, and I am planning to live stream it, I think, at this point. Uh, if, and if not that, I'll still have a reaction video. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of cool, kind of interesting. Moving on. Uh, I covered the Nindies event and I said why I'm pumped about Nintendo Switch exclusives Golf Story and Travis Strikes Again. And Trevor Grover had this to say. I don't get why people are excited over sports games like FIFA, but I could see this Golf Story at least try something that isn't just sports games. And Golf Story basically turns golf into an RPG like the Super Mario RPG. And it's understandable where there's some appeal there. But I want to talk specifically about, you know, you don't understand why people get excited over sports games. Because I'm one of those people that gets excited over sports games. I'm buying NBA 2K18 day one on Switch. And I, you're not going to understand it if you're not a huge sports fan. I think sports games, especially the simulation type, really only appeal to people who are fans of the sports. I'm a big NBA fan, so I love playing a simulated version of a sport I enjoy watching. Uh, it's cool to play as my favorite players. It's cool to... Uh, one thing I really like doing is micromanaging teams, like being a GM of a basketball team, being a GM of an NFL team, uh, and like adding players that I know, you know, drafting rookies and doing all these crazy things and trying to rebuild the... Rock. Like, I, I always like playing with the Milwaukee Bucks because I'm a Wisconsin guy. I, I, I love the Bucks, And they're usually not very good. Although now... They're kind of good, so it'll be interesting to see what can I do to bring them over to the top. Sometimes I do completely unrealistic things, like, oh, let me go get LeBron James, who would never come to Milwaukee. But uh, sometimes I also like to be realistic, like, what kind of player would come to Milwaukee? Like, could could they convince, um, you know, someone like Kyrie Irving? They probably couldn't, but, but you know what I mean? Like, like, who could they convince to come over to the Bucks and put them over to the top? And what kind of roster build? It, it's a lot of fun for people who like sports. I love sports, so I love simulating. I love being part of it. I love playing it. I, I love playing actual sports, too. So, yeah, it's it's just a lot of fun. It's something you're not going to understand if you're not in that ecosystem. It's kind of like how some people don't understand how you can sit down and play this giant world of Breath of the Wild for hours on end uh, because that's just not what they're into. You know, unless you are into it, you're not really going to grasp it. And my fiance is sometimes like that. She doesn't know why I like certain video games. She doesn't get it. Um, she actually gets the sports game thing because I'm a sports fan. So, there you go. Um, there's another video this past week about how some Switch physical games are going to require micro SDXC cards. Uh, and then I gave a little update on where I was that weekend because I skipped a couple days. And Ray Lopez had this to say, Thank you, Nintendo Prime. You seem to be as unbiased as they come. Which, sadly, I have to point out. I do think this is a legitimate concern of the Switch. 
I don't think this will plague any first party games, but that's probably even worse as the console already isn't as inviting to third parties as PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. And first off, thank you. Uh, I want to note that I don't like the word unbiased because literally we as human beings do not have the ability to be unbiased. The only way that something is unbiased is if it's just a statement of facts. There can't be really a conclusion unless it's a scientific conclusion. So when, or even a mathematical conclusion, obviously, you know, four divided by two is two. I mean, there's no debate over that. But outside of those kind of conclusions, when it comes to video games, you can't really... Uh, quantify things like that you can in the video game industry you can't quantify it there's bias and everything so even in this topic where i talk about switch physical games current sdxc cards and blah 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 blah, it's still an opinion it's still a bias of mine that i think the switch should have enough internal storage to be able to play any single game released on it i think when you buy the, the system out of the box you should be able to play any game released on the platform without having to buy anything else. And the fact that you do have to buy something else for certain third-party games uh, is a barrier. And no matter how much I, I, I think that's the case, and no matter how, how well I articulate my opinions on it, they're still opinions. Yes, there are facts that are behind the opinions. A lot of people base their opinions on what they believe to be facts or what are actual facts. Most people don't just have opinions that have opinions. They, they have what they feel are facts or are realistic facts. But those facts are just some of the core basis of what your bias might become. Uh, I have a bias towards Nintendo. That's why I run a Nintendo channel. I recognize I have a bias towards Nintendo. And I try my best, knowing that I have that bias, to be open-minded about things that go against my thought perspective. But at the same point, I'm not unbiased. No one is, and I'm, I'm glad that you think I'm at least level-headed. That, that's what I, I try to approach any topic level, uh, as even keel as I can to try to see both sides, but I clearly have my own personal opinions and stances, and that does seep into my work here. In fact, this whole channel is based around my opinions, so take that for what you will, but thank you for your comment. Uh, moving on. I uh, did a video about our constant struggle with YouTube and Nintendo, uh, dealing with copyright strikes and demonetization and all that stuff. Uh, ironically, that video was demonetized. Um, I was able to actually request a manual review of that video, and it got remonetized. But by then, I already had most of my viewership, so I didn't really make anything. Welcome to YouTube, the new YouTube. Uh, and Gabriel Perello had this to say, I personally can't support you right now other than watching your vids and adding to your views, liking and other kinds of YouTube stuff. I'm assuming subscribing, right? Um, but I love your channel and I would love to see you do well. If you want suggestions for what you get for support on Patreon, then open a chat on Discord on something, unless you already have one that I don't know about. So yes, we do have a Nintendo Prime public Discord uh, I'll put a link to it down in the description. I just started adding links to it in the most recent videos I've created, uh, realizing that I've never really advertised that we have it. So yes, we have a Discord. Might even toss up the URL, the crazy URL, to, to go to it right here in the video itself. But yeah, it's definitely something that I value. I, I can't guarantee I'm personally going to be able to respond. I keep hitting the microphone. Uh, that I'm going to be able to respond to people uh directly through there all the time I, I have in the past been talking to some fans on there but uh the bigger and bigger the discord channel gets the more and more it needs to be moderated by people that aren't myself and the more less and less i'm gonna have time to respond to people in there uh i do have a community forum but it's down right now until i can afford to pay the bill on that i'm hoping crossing my fingers well crossing my fingers that by the end of the month i i will have that done but yeah uh, obviously the best way I always say to support us is just liking, subscribing and watching our content and enjoying it and sharing it with your friends. Uh, beyond that, obviously we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Nintendo prime. I appreciate any and all monetary support there. Or anyone who does super chats or does any sort of donations while I live stream. I appreciate all that because all of that combined enables me to do what I do here. Plus my second job, uh, which I don't talk about a lot here because it's not, nothing to do with Nintendo prime. Um, that second job, I would love to be able to quit someday and just do Nintendo Prime um, because this is what I'm passionate about and this is where I want to be. So, moving on. 
Oh, and by the way, if you have any suggestions for Patreon tiers or different rewards you guys out there would like for Patreon that would get you to subscribe to our Patreon, or uh, let me know. Like, the, the one suggestion we had a couple months ago was about adding a tier where people could pay a premium to be a guest on the podcast. And someone actually took advantage of that in our most latest podcast, and you're going to see that throughout this week. So, yeah, that's obviously an excellent suggestion. And if you guys have any other suggestions for rewards uh, for your Patreon support uh, in different tiers or different goals we should have, let me know. I'm all th- This is your community as much as it's my community. So we should work together to find out what you guys want, uh, what you're willing to pay for, and what you hope to get in return. Moving on. Uh, tenth video, halfway through. Uh, Nintendo loses a lawsuit that reminds us that the Switch isn't immune. Uh, and because the Switch is currently going through a lawsuit, and Nintendo lost a lawsuit over the Wii motes, uh, and Donkey Kong fan responded by saying, Thank you so much for not shouting doom and gloom for Nintendo. You Yet you looked at the worst possible scenario and still said it wouldn't be the end of the Switch with facts. Again, another example where I clearly had bias in that conversation. But... I felt like there was enough strong facts to suggest that uh, we don't have anything to worry about with Switch. And if I feel like there's enough strong facts, I'm going to give that to you guys and hopefully ease anyone's worries over it while not pretending that it's not like an issue. It is an issue. Nintendo getting getting sued, by the, whether it's a patent troll or not, um, is always an issue. And especially a bigger issue for Nintendo than it is for any of us. We're consumers. If we lose our products, whatever, there's always more products. But uh, yeah, it's... Yeah, just thank you. I'm glad that people uh, recognize some of the research and work I put into some of my videos. Uh, All of my videos, maybe. (laughs) Moving on. Uh, The 11th video of this Prime comments uh, was the Final Fantasy XV's luminous engine doesn't run well on Nintendo Switch. Uh, Again, this this came from the people behind Final Fantasy XV. They said they tossed the engine on Switch just to see what would happen, and it didn't go well. Uh, they noted it wasn't optimized or any of that. And Logan Ubiv Tonomal Ablar had this to say, Okay, am I the only person that doesn't want Final Fantasy XV on Switch in any capacity? I'd much rather see an quality original IP on Switch instead. Trying to shoehorn PlayStation 4 and Xbox One games onto Switch seems like a recipe for failure. And then Michael Crafter replied, yeah, I don't want it either. I don't want it on PlayStation 4. I'm not going to want it on the Switch. Look back to the Wii, and you see an awful lot of third-party exclusives. The system made money, so third parties uh, made games that appealed to the crowd. I think that's the kind of support we're going to see. And I can't tell you how much I disagree with this notion. I think, as a consumer, it's perfectly fine to say, I want to have my cake and eat it too. And that expression, as silly as that expression really is, think about it, I want my cake and eat it. I mean, if you have your cake, why, why wouldn't you eat it? Uh, but the expression essentially points out that I want my exclusive original IPs and I want my third-party support as well. I don't, I don't think one needs to be compromised for the other, right? We're going to get original IPs. We already have in ARMS, and there's going to be more. And we're already going, you know, think about, I know Mario plus Rabbids technically isn't an original IP, but it's definitely an original spinoff of the Mario and Rabbids series, an original crossover that looks absolutely fantastic. I mean, it doesn't just look fantastic. I did a review of it, and I think it's the best Switch exclusive right now. And if you look at what third parties did on Wii, while there were some some gems, you know, we, we had the No More Heroes series, we had... A Little King's Story, Mad World. Uh, those games in particular didn't necessarily perform that well. The games that did perform well were things like Just Dance. And that's the kind of future you want for Switch? I, I, as much as I love Just Dance, I own Just Dance 2017. I live streamed me playing Just Dance 2017 on the Switch not too long ago. I know that video is not public, so you can't watch this fat guy <laughs> playing Just Dance. Uh What is key, I think, in all of this is that there's no right or wrong for for what you want on the Switch. Like just because you don't want Final Fantasy XV or other PlayStation 4 and Xbox One ports doesn't make it wrong for other people like myself to want them. Uh, So yeah, again, there's no right or wrong here. I just I don't see there anything wrong with asking for everything. Uh, I mean, 
taking all these games on the go is just such an enticing prospect to me. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I just really disagree with what you guys had to say. Uh, the 12th video from this past week. Let's talk about purposeful shortages of Nintendo Switch, Amiibo, NES, and S and and SNES classics. Uh, obviously, that was just a talking point uh, where I was just talking about all the different shortages and why I don't think that uh, you can blanket them all together. I think each individual shortage issue has its own concerns. It does present an overall problem at Nintendo that these concerns keep happening. Uh, and RM underscore Prime said that people who understand how things are made already realized this is the problem. The thing that the people who think Nintendo employ golden geese that produce ready-to-ship consoles every five minutes are also a problem. Just make more! It isn't easy. Getting the parts from the companies, then having them delivered to the factory in China, then shipping them out worldwide takes a lot of time. And it's not just getting the parts and assembly and shipping. Everyone has to deal with that. It's more so the scarcity of the parts. When it's really hard to get a hold of the NAND flash memory chips, or really hard to get a hold of some of the tech behind the HD Rumble, you can have all the manufacturing ready to go in the world to throw it all together, but if, you're, if your orders are not being fully fulfilled with the proper parts to build a Switch, you're going to have a, a, a I guess, what do they call that? A bottleneck, right? You're, you're going to have a bottleneck in the manufacturing process that Nintendo, unfortunately, can't do anything about because of the worldwide shortages. So with the worldwide shortages happening, Nintendo's just kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place uh, when it comes to dealing with this. And it sucks, and I'm hoping that it's solved by next year at some point. 13th video from this past week, the Pokemon CEO talked about Pokemon on Switch and why they are tepid on the system's success. And some guy responded by saying, this seems sort of clickbaity. He said he thought it would fail, but he also admitted he was wrong. He also said that we shouldn't overestimate it, but that's a far cry from unenthusiastic, just common sense. And I don't think, if you just take the words that, that he said out of context, Forget everything else he said. If you just look at his words about how he thought the Switch wouldn't succeed, he admitted he was wrong. It is clearly a success. But then he says, you know, people should still temper their expectations. I look at that on its own as fine. That's not negative, right? That's not a tepid response. But squeezed in between those remarks, like literally in between them, is this big, long, enthusiastic uh, chat rant, whatever you want to call it, about AR, right? He, like, he can't just stay on the Switch. He, like, quickly uh, turns from talking about how how he was wrong about Switch to, oh, but AR is going to be amazing, and there's all these great ideas I have for AR, and AR this, and AR that, and Pokemon Go, and blah, 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 blah. And, oh, and by the way, you should temper your expectations on the Switch. Like, it, it's sandwiching all that stuff, putting it in context that shows that's clearly where he was excited, and the Switch portions of the interview we're definitely where he didn't seem that enthusiastic at all. So in context with the whole interview, uh, he definitely was not very enthusiastic about the Switch. Hence my uh, phrasing of him being tepid. Uh, if you think it's clickbaity, I, I can't do anything about that. I honestly don't think there's anything wrong with clickbait as long as it's truthful to what is being presented. Obviously, this term you were using clickbaity as it not being truthful, but that's my take. You're free to disagree with my take. That's okay. I'm, I'm cool with people disagreeing with me. Uh, the 14th video from this past week, LOA Noir is coming to the Nintendo Switch with all DLC and unique features. Uh, by the way, it's also $10 more expensive for the physical version on Switch. Just throwing that out there. Uh, Como had this to say, this is everything we could want or need for a third party AAA release on Switch. This is the full game with DLC and it has use of the Joy-Con, HD Rumble, and touchscreen features. If other titles like this follow suit, the Switch could be a huge success. Uh, yeah, I, I think any port uh, to Switch or any new release to Switch, any multi-platform release, this is what you want. What's happening with this is more ideal than what's happening with NBA 2K18. Although you'd like to see pricing parity, there's also that point where people are starting to say, you know, digital games should cost less than physical. It would be interesting if they started applying this to other systems besides Nintendo. Clearly it costs more for the physical version because cartridges cost more. But let's say they charge 50 bucks for LA Noir on Xbox One but 40 digitally. That actually makes a lot of sense. Uh... I'm not, I'm not actually advocating they increase the price on Xbox One and PlayStation 4. If anything, I'd like them to sell the physical version for 40 and, and the digital for 30 But 
it's still one of those things where um, this is definitely the way I want third parties to treat Nintendo. And, I mean, come on, we're talking about Rockstar. Rockstar Games is releasing one of their big games on Switch. That's just, old or not, that, that's just awesome. It's just as, as mind-blowing to me as Skyrim coming. Whoever thought those kind of games would be coming to a Nintendo platform, like, ever. Moving on. The 15th video from this past week. Nintendo can't guarantee Nintendo Switch stock for the holidays. And Joshua Jones responded by saying, What you're not saying is what enough is. The system is outselling the PlayStation 4 just about 3 to 1 in Japan compared to their first 6 months. And in the US it's selling out as soon as it's stocked. You make it sound like this is a stock problem. When in fact it's a demand problem. If they release 3 million units pulling them out of their arse, basically, they would sell all 3 million. Unless they somehow manage to pull 5 million units worldwide out of thin air, they will not be able to keep up with demand. It's hot as heck right now, and they are pushing around 1 million units each month, and they still sell out like they put out 2,000. Examine all the facts, not just the negative buzz. This is bad for all people that want one this holiday. But on the other hand, this is great for continued support from Nintendo, AAA, third parties, and indies. And I did respond to him, but I wanted to talk about this again because I wanted to make a broader response that more people can hear. The facts of the situation are the Nintendo Switch is not selling a million units every month. Period. Outside of the launch month, it has yet to sell a million units in any single month since release. And that's because of a stock issue. Number two, I never called demand an issue uh if there is not enough stock to meet demand that's a stock problem that's a manufacturing problem that's a nintendo problem it's not the fault that consumers want to buy something you can have unplanned successes and you could argue that the demand was unplanned but they've known that the switch was in high demand since it launched in march and they haven't been able to fix the problem and that means the problem rests somewhere in the manufacturing line. Again, we kind of know it's because of the NAND flash shortage primarily and that Nintendo is kind of restricted. But yeah, it's it's just, it's out there. It's a thing. Uh, I did examine all the facts of the situation, if I'm being honest. Uh, and I'm not just taking advantage of negative buzz. I don't think there's a thing such as taking advantage of negative buzz. That's just my reaction to it. So, and plus I have plenty of positive stuff on this channel. Come on now. Come on now. Moving on. Moving on to our 16th video this past week. Almost there, folks. 21 videos, remember? Switch's storage issue is showing that many gamers still don't understand the system, and this was a response I made to a video created by Richard Review Tech USA and an Nintendo Enthusiast article. Um, and Rain the Insane had this to say, that flying battery gameplay was painful. And this is referring to my Sonic Mania gameplay of the flying battery level that I had playing in the background of the video. And, yeah, it was pretty bad. <laughs> uh, I admit that I forgot how to play Sonic games. I have not played a traditional 2D side-scrolling Sonic game since I was a very little kid, and I probably wasn't very... I mean, I thought I was awesome, but I probably wasn't very good at Sonic games back then either. Uh, you know, th there are a lot of people giving me tips. Thank you so much for the tips. Uh, things like when you're running and you go upside down on the wall, just keep pushing your control stick in the same direction because the controls are inverted when you're on the wall, which... To me, it's still hard to wrap my mind around. That's how the controls work. But it makes a lot of sense. And it obviously would have fixed a lot of the issues I was having playing Sonic Mania. Uh, specifically that level. And I, I just want to note that I don't always... I'm not good at every game I play, right? You're going to see me play a lot of games on this channel that I'm not any good at. Because I don't play those games very often. Probably the game I play the most often is Breath of the Wild. <laughs> And even then, I'm not going to admit I'm the most skillful gamer. I'm not here at Nintendo Prime because I am the most skillful gamer in the world. I'm just very, very passionate about Nintendo games and video games in general. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I guess I don't, I'm not going to apologize for being bad. <laughs> um, I still had a good time, right? Isn't that why we play games to have a good time? Bad or not, you know, how many people have complained about the fact that I don't use motion controls in Splatoon 2? Oh, watching you not use motion controls is so painful. Who cares? I'm having a good time. You don't have to play that way. It's all good. Anyways, <laughs> moving on. Uh, video number 17, Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle Review! The best Switch exclusive? I think it is. 
uh, yeah, we had our first ever review, first ever video review. Had a lot of useful feedback on there, especially in terms of like reading things, you know, because obviously you you write your script and there, everyone's reading the script, but sometimes you want to put some improv sessions in there and you want to make things sound more natural. Uh, I'll, if you guys don't know, outside of when I'm like reading a quote or something, a lot of the videos I create here are completely off the cuff and I do that on purpose because I know I am bad at reading a script and making it sound natural. But uh yeah, it is something I'm going to have to improve for reviews because reviews are really hard to do off the cuff uh, because you need to compile your thoughts uh, in a more concise manner. Otherwise, you'll end up with like a five-hour review for me and I might repeat myself like seven times. So, uh, And I know there's some people that enjoy those really, really long reviews like, hello, Matthew Matosis. But uh, yeah, King Shadow Omega had this to say, at Nintendo Prime, good review. But I think you should at least put a spoiler-free section in the beginning of the video with quick bullet points. Because at the end of the day, while I understand you wanting to give the best review possible, it doesn't change that a huge amount of people watch reviews to decide if they should buy the game. For me, it doesn't matter since I already bought it. LOL. And good point. There, there were a, quite a few people who uh, were... I mean, they weren't... They didn't feel bad about my review because I mentioned at the beginning of the review, I'm going to spoil stuff and I don't care because... Uh, I, my stance on reviews is that there's plenty of reviews out there that try to be as spoiler free as possible. And what's a spoiler for someone isn't a spoiler for somebody else. And there's all this fine dancing. I used to have to deal with this at Zelda Informer. You know, when we're talking about Zelda games, even if we're not reviewing, we're just writing a news post or we're writing an editorial, you know, where's that fine line between when we need to spoil the warning stuff, when we need to not spoil the warning, when we shouldn't even talk about something, when we should. And obviously the obvious thing is like, oh, don't talk about story. But then some people are like, yeah, but I need to know a little bit of the story to know if I'm interested and what, what bits do you want to know? And I want to avoid all that at Nintendo Prime. Nintendo Prime, I'm just going to review the game. And it's going to have spoilers. There's going to be footage that's spoilers. There's going to be what I talk about. Some things I'm going to talk about are spoilers. Now, I didn't actually spoil much of the story in Mario Plus Rabbids beyond like the very beginning uh, because I didn't feel like I needed to to review this game. The, the story it, it was not. It's not the reason to continue playing this game, right? It's not the primary reason. No, it's good. It's really good, and it should be uh, something all Mario games aspire to. I think, but. It's still not uh, what I think is the main selling point and the main thing to review in the game. Uh, so I literally just described how zany the story was, and then I'm like, it's good, just trust me, you'll see it for yourself. And I even showed off a boss fight or part of a boss fight, um, even part of the ending boss fight, that uh, no one seemed to react negatively to, and I think that's the way it's going to be. Now for your suggestion to put bullet points at the front, I feel like maybe that is something I can look into. Uh, being just saying, look, all my reviews are always going to be full of full of spoilers. But before I get into them, I could just run a bullet point rundown, like a quick summary uh, that will help people to determine if they want to buy it. I guess I could try to serve both crowds. There are other suggestions out there that maybe I should do like a spoiler-free version and then wait a few weeks and then do like you know an, an all-out version. Uh, and I feel like there's points of that with the podcast where like we'll talk about a game, but then like there's a certain point, you know. I haven't decided, but maybe it's a month or two months later that we can take down the spoiler wall and just not worry about spoiling things anymore. We do need to have uh, some sort of uh, thing for that for for like a podcast. But for reviews, I'm always going to warn their spoilers. Maybe I'll consider putting um, a little quick summary at the beginning of the review instead of at the end. Yeah, I, I actually see some value in that where I could try to serve both crowds of one video. Just so you know, reviews are a lot of work. Uh, that review video for Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle is probably the video that I put the most amount of work into. Because not only did I have to spend 55... I mean, I had to spend 55 hours, but I chose to spend 55 hours playing the game. And I had to play a lot of the game, and it took away a lot of my personal life and a lot of my free time uh, to get through the game and get everything done that I wanted to get done in it for a review so I could have it done within the first couple of weeks of release rather than waiting months and months. Uh, on top of that, recording all the footage, I actually discovered in creating reviews that I have nowhere near enough storage. I have like I have a one terabyte external hard drive. I have a one terabyte internal plus a 500 gigabyte uh, SSD, and I usually don't have any problems with videos like this. But uh, yeah, recording all the footage and getting everything set at 1080p, 60 FPS, and all that stuff was very very hard 
uh, on my storage limitations um, and I had to delete some files I really didn't want to delete because I just had no other way to store it. I even tried storing it in the cloud, but I have limited cloud storage. It's it's just a big mess. Uh, reviews are really, really hard work to do, and I hope you appreciate it because I knew the review was going to be one of our lowest viewed videos. Again, at the time of the time of posting this, was like 1.1 thousand views, no, 1.100 views or whatever it is. 1,100 views, 1,100 views. And that's a, a really low view video. So the amount of work compared to the viewership... Um, is not good and it would suggest I shouldn't do reviews uh, but I think reviews could be an important part of our channel moving forward and I'm hoping that you guys support it and maybe that's a, a future patreon tier I could do where um, you know I'll only make reviews if people support a certain tier and I will review the games that they ask me to review whether it's an indie game whether it's a new Nintendo game NBA 2k18 I have some interest in reviewing that whatever it might be but yeah I, I enjoyed making the review. It seems like a lot of people thought the, the content of the review. That's the most important part. Whether or not I sucked at reading it, whether or not my, my editing skills with the footage was great, people thought the actual review, the, the, the little words I had to say, were really, really good. That's the most important part of a review. So I'm really glad I nailed that. Um, it took so many drafts for me to, to get that review to where I wanted it to be. And even then, I still had some mistakes. Like I called it a, a boy's room, where it was actually a girl's room, like a girl genius. Um, that's my fault. I didn't take any notes and I didn't replay the beginning to, to double check, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully reviews are our mainstay here and we'll get better. Uh, 18th video from this past week. Nintendo Switch may have a universal achievement system in the works. This is a rumor. It comes from an indie developer. And, uh, KVK, IF1, uh, I can who knows. Uh, he said, I don't feel safe getting these achievements when your account could be potentially deleted. If someone stole my Switch or I got hacked, it could get deleted. I prefer the PlayStation accounts that don't get deleted. I'm not a Sony fangirl. I have a PlayStation 4 and a Switch. But how can you delete your account so easily on the 3DS worries me. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's actually easier to delete accounts on, on 3DS and Switch. Uh, than it is PlayStation 4. I've deleted PlayStation 4 accounts before. Really, was pretty simple. Uh, I think the difference isn't isn't the what scares me about Nintendo's account system uh, that we don't have confirmed yet is that it's not a universal account system, right? You can't use your account on multiple switches, and because of that, if you damage your switch, if you lose your switch. It's really hard to get that account on another system. Now, Nintendo of America and customer support might help you do that, as they did with Wii U and 3DS. But it's still a really scary thought that everything is tied to an, a system and an account, and it's easy to lose access to that account. Um, and that's what makes achievements, and even an all-digital future, very, very difficult on Nintendo platforms. Now, I think Nintendo is, you know, they have everything set up now. The way the, the Nintendo account works now is very much like a universal account system without some of the capabilities of that. So Nintendo just has to decide to enable it, and I hope they will. And, yeah, I understand your concerns, um, but, again, I think Nintendo already has the systems in place to address those concerns. Let's just hope they address them by the time they launch their online, paid online, next year. Moving on, video number 19. It says, let's talk about the digital future of Nintendo Switch. Uh, again, another talk about the storage and all that stuff. And there's a little bit of a conversation here. Um, Eporion had this to say, This snipper clips gameplay hurts to watch. I was playing snipper clips for that video. Um, and then I replied, It's just a pain in the butt to play solo. The game is so much better in co-op. And uh, seriously, snipper clips is amazing in co-op. Uh, and I haven't touched the game in nearly five months. And then Joshua Werner replied, Is Nintendo Prime good at any game? LOL. And... <laughs> This gets back to the point earlier made about my uh, Sonic Mania gameplay. I'm not good at a lot of games. I mean, I know there's a controversy going out there right now because there was a certain uh, journalist who posted uh, some footage of him uh, playing the demo of Cuphead and they couldn't even get like the basic premise of hitting a jump put button while pressing over on a control stick at the same time. Like, that's... Some really, really basic video game 101. Uh, and I feel like that's not something I struggle with. But there are games I don't play very often, like Snipper Clips. Like, I got really good at Snipper Clips for a little while. And then I haven't played it in five months. So I kind of forgot all the controls. And on top of that, that was the like first time I had 
ever played Snipper Clip solo. So I had no idea how to switch characters. I had no idea if there were any limitations. It turns out there's not any limitations. It's just really annoying. And it's definitely like overcooked. It's a game that's best played multiplayer. Uh, but yeah, it's... Sorry about that. I'm... I promise I'm actually a lot better at snipper clips uh, than you think. And as for Josh, you know, am I good at any game? I mean, some of my Breath of the Wild live streams, I like to think I, I, I did pretty well. I'm definitely not an expert. As an example, I've never beaten a Lionel. Uh, I will obviously need to be doing that in my 100% Breath of the Wild Master Mode run, so I'm actually choosing to finally defeat a Lionel and defeat the Lionels when they are the har absolute hardest <laughs> in Master Mode. But whatever, I, I have a good time. And I'm not the best Zelda player in the world. I'm not the best Mario player. I'm not the best any player. I mean, I play a lot of Madden. I'm not the best Madden player. Uh, I don't profess to be the highest skilled gamer out there or even a professional level gamer. I am a gaming enthusiast. I love playing video games. I do not get to play them as much as I want now that I'm a father. And that does lead to my skills deteriorating. Plus, I'm 31. I think I've realized my hand-eye coordination isn't as good as it was when I was a teenager. Uh, and maybe that's why you see most professional gamers are teens to mid-20s. Uh, because that's like the peak of your hand-eye coordination ability. Uh, there is a delay as you get older. But yeah, I my lack of skills with these games aren't because of the lack of hand-eye coordination. It's just me being stupid and not knowing what I'm doing. Uh, me not playing the games enough. And you'll find that a lot with games I play. Uh, like Double Dragon 4 that I played on a video. Uh, it might not have looked like I was doing bad. But I was doing bad. Uh, I used to play a ton of Double Dragon as a kid. Especially Double Dragon 2. And... I totally forgot how that game controls, how to grab people and pin them down and start kneeing them and then chucking them over my back. That used to be a move I did all the time. I used to always do uh, the jumping and flying kicks everywhere, and I found myself struggling to do that now because it's just been so long since I've had to do it um, that I, it's, it's not like riding a bike, right? You, you played a lot of Double Dragon as a kid. You should be just as good as it now as you were back then. That's not really how it is. Um, I'm just as good at riding a bike now as I was when I was a kid for the most part, Uh yeah, actually, I think I'm almost exactly as good as I was. Maybe I can't ride for as long a distance anymore. But, uh, yeah, it's video games aren't always like that. It's always not like like riding a bike. Uh, sometimes it just takes a while for me to pick it up. And if I, the more and more I play a Sonic Mania, the more and more I play a Snipper Clips and any other game, the better I hope you see me become. Even in my run of Sonic Mania, uh, well, I didn't figure out that you kept the directional... Uh, joystick pushed in the same direction uh, when you go upside down. I never figured that out on my gameplay. I definitely improved uh, throughout that video in terms of my performance and the levels, and that's what I always look for in games. And generally, I play video games to have a good time. As long as I'm having a good time, it doesn't matter if I'm good at the game. So, yeah. Uh, moving on. Video number 20, do game devs have right to take out videos they don't like? And I have to be really careful on this one. It's another episode outside the box because it deals with some touchy topics that YouTube does not like people talking about. Um, so I stuck to a comment that I feel is pretty safe. YouTube, please, please don't demonetize this video. Um, Alex Crystal 13 just a small correction. It's Digital Homicide that went after Jim Sterling, not Digital Revolver. Good video anyways. Yes, sorry about that. I thought when I was editing the video that Digital Revolver didn't sound right. I, I knew it was Digital something, and Digital uh, Revolver just rolled off my tongue. And while I was editing, I'm like, man, was that really it? And I could have looked it up and changed it, but I was in kind of a rush to get that video out. Uh, Digital Homicide, obviously, uh, was the company that went after Jim Sterling for his opinions on their games and tried to DMCA claim things and demonetize and then eventually sue for defamation and a whole bunch of whole bunch of stuff that ended up not holding up in the court of law and was a win in general for all of YouTube. Um, but yeah, it's uh, very, very interesting how that all played out. It's very interesting to see what's going to play out with the current situation. Uh, if you haven't watched the video, go watch it. I don't want to talk about it here because, again, YouTube does not like it. Uh our last video, the PlayStation 4 handheld could exist. Does it impact Nintendo Switch? And this is from the Nintendo Prime Podcast, episode 32, part 1. And as a reminder, you can get early access to every single episode of the Nintendo Prime Podcast at patreon.com slash Nintendo Prime for $5 a month. You subscribe, you gain access. That's one of the main things we have going on at Patreon. Uh, in fact, most of our backers on Patreon are of the $5 variety. And this comes from Couch Gaming News. All I hear is Nintendo fans getting scared because they know if Sony were to do this, then it would kill the Switch because companies will all flock to the PlayStation 4 like the past. Most third-party games are on the PlayStation 4. 
I disagree. Uh, obviously not the, the, the fact that most third-party games on PlayStation 4 uh, and PC and Xbox One. That's completely true. Uh, even if a portable PlayStation 4 existed or something close, like you know, even if it's not the power of PlayStation 4, but somewhere in between, and in between a PlayStation 4 and a Switch is one time on. And they, they pull that off with AMD tech and they're doing all these cool things. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that... Uh, that doesn't spell doom. Like, I'm not scared as a Nintendo fan. I, I even said in the podcast, I hope that this thing releases. It should exist. Nintendo needs competition in the mobile space. Uh, without that competition, besides for mobile phones, obviously, like a dedicated gaming, gaming space, without competition, Nintendo is left on an island to kind of do as they please. And when Nintendo is left on that island to do as they please, they don't always do a very good job. Voice chat is an example uh, so I'm hoping that it comes in because competition will breed excellence. And yes, it'll get third-party stuff that maybe the Switch doesn't, but it can also push Nintendo to improve the Switch in many ways that are pro-consumer. And I'm not worried about the success of Nintendo. Now that we know Pokemon's coming, if they can convince the next Monster Hunter game, not Worlds, but the next big Monster Hunter game to also come to Switch, uh, and you know, any you know, Yokai Watch and all these other popular handheld games, uh, bring back Ace Attorney and stuff, I think they'll be fine. Nintendo has dominated in the handheld space for practically 30 years at this point. I, I think it's premature to worry about another PlayStation system, portable, uh, ruining Nintendo's success in the handheld space. They've already tried it twice and couldn't do it. Uh, you know, Sega tried it. A lot of other companies have tried going toe-to-toe with Nintendo in the handheld space, and Nintendo is the only one that's still doing it consistently. So, the, the only one who's really ever done it consistently. And obviously, you know, I'm not going to sit here and talk about how the PS Vita tanked, blah, blah, blah. I don't know that that's relevant to this conversation because mistakes happen. I mean, the Wii U tanked. Nintendo's still here. Still making game systems. Still technically making home consoles. So, anyways, folks, that's going to do it for this episode of Prime Comments. I hope I, I have no idea how long this is. I hope I was able to condense it. I think the longest Prime Comments episode ever has been an hour. Uh, this is 21 videos, two weeks worth of videos. I am exhausted. Whew, time to get editing. I love you guys. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, and as always, if you have any suggestions to improve our Patreon or give you any tiers on Patreon uh, that you want to see happen that could uh, add value to your experience at Nintendo Prime, let me know. I'm open to any and all suggestions. I love this place. I hope you love it too. I will see you guys in the next one.